Welcome to the Good and Basic Podcast, a long-form conversation between Joseph and Joseph, and, well, I suppose you too, um, about the videos on our channel, youtube.com slash goodandbasic, as well as lots of other related topics. More so, on that later. Yes, more on that <laughs> later. So welcome very much to the show. Um, today we're going to be talking, uh, well, we're really using the two videos more as a launch pad, right? Yes. So we're, uh, video one is about mushrooms. I found a mushroom uh, in, in my yard, and I licked it but did not eat it and, and we so have to do the lord of the there's rings a giant line. mushrooms <laughs> yeah. yeah and so there's this giant epistemological i realized that there were like massive questions of epistemology lodged into a cottonwood tree trunk yeah right uh, and also questions about of life management. and death questions of life and death embedded in a tree trunk okay and then the second video is about uh this really cool uh earth house a yeah fremont earth house uh down in cedar city utah um, there's a great museum there. There used to be an iron mine. Well, I guess there technically still is an iron mine there. Um, well, there used to be an iron mine there too. It, it 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 it's there is an iron mine there, and then people will open it up and use it as a mine and mine in it only if the price of iron raises to a certain <laughs> point. So it might be which, open right now, which is just hilarious, right? Like when yeah. you think about it, there's I don't know how much how much money worth of iron stuck in the ground there but it has to be cost efficient to pull it out. Because unfortunately it costs money to reach in there and grab it. Uh-huh. And it costs more money to reach in there and grab it than it does to reach into other places in the world and grab it. Yeah, which is crazy. And then to ship it over to the iron mine. Yeah. So yeah. The, the the iron mine was our rationale originally for visiting Cedar City mostly, but uh, we, well, we happened to also find this, you know, crazy awesome dirt house. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk just a little bit more about mushroom epistemology <laughs> first. Um, yeah, so one of the things I mentioned in the video, right, is somebody has to be the first one to eat the mushroom. Yep. And then after somebody dies, there has to be a second person who's willing to eat the mushroom, right? Uh, well, to eat another mushroom, right? You can't just throw away the entire class because... Or you can, yeah. but once you've thrown away the entire class, then how do you find the good ones? And we actually have found the good ones, right? So at some point, someone had to look at that mushroom and say, I have no freaking clue what this thing is going to do to me and pop it in their mouth. Yeah. And and it's not like there aren't clues, right? So for instance, does it give off a noxious stench? Hey, you know, not idiot proof, but but it's a it's a it's great a first line it's a of great defense. yeah, it's a first yeah, it's a first line of defense. It's yeah. it's it's a heuristic. You know, it is not a perfect test, but it is a heuristic, right? Um okay, I I touch it to my tongue or I lick it, you know, did I die 24 hours later? No. Okay, things are starting to still look up, you know. Um feed it to your dog. Oh, hey. I don't know if that was the original testing no, method, but that is but a thing. You're right, but right? that analogizes that analogizes well, to some degree. Analogizes, to some degree, right? Because unfortunately, well, as a fact of nature, what is poisonous to one species is not necessarily poisonous to another. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, I mean, this is a problem that you run into with neurological experiments. Well, all kinds of experiments, right? Is okay. So you have a new drug. What are you going to test it on? Because maybe for ethical reasons, you can't test it on humans. Right. So you probably shouldn't test it on humans. What's your next best proxy? Right. Or if you're doing neurological or psychological research. Right. Uh, well, my understanding is that psychologists will often use rats. I'm assuming because their 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 neurology and social uh, th their degree and type of social interaction is such that it can form a rough proxy. Right. But like finding a proxy is not necessarily the easiest thing in the world. And it's still not perfect. So mm -hmm. it, rats are similar to humans. Mm -hmm. True statement. Are they similar um, enough for the experiment results to transfer across? Hopefully. And that is a question that you don't know the answer to until after you've run the experiment on both rats mm -hmm. and humans. And so even if your dog eats the mushroom, uh, I was going to say one thing I don't have in common with rats is if you tickle me with a pencil eraser, I do not laugh ultrasonically. At least so far as I know. <laughs> um, what the random? Well, rats do laugh yeah. ultrasonically if you tickle them with a pencil eraser. They laugh yeah, ultrasonically. They laugh ultrasonically wow. when you tickle them with a pencil eraser. Now you know eraser, something. Right? Yeah, and there was somebody who... who you know, got a research grant for I that. want to know what I the want research to tickle paper rats. looks like. <laughs> the title of that um, paper. Yeah. Yeah. So, but uh, so, okay. So you feed the mushroom to your dog, right? And at some point you still have to eat the mushroom or feed it to someone you love. And you know, it's interesting. I was thinking as I was uh, working on those mushrooms, there were quite a few mushrooms on those logs. Mm -hmm. So I could have fed them to family members. And that was a horrifying thought. Like that was a horrifying thought because I thought, you know, like, okay, so on the one hand, you know, in some respects I say, well, look, my life is my life. If I want to bump myself off, I can bump myself off, right? If I want to take that risk, I can take that risk. But it actually turns out that there's 
the risks of all sorts of other people woven into that. Yeah. In that particular case, right? Yeah, and the and idea of like, testing it on someone else so as to avoid the risk yourself. That I was actually I was more scared about feeding it to anyone else than than to me, right? Like you just yeah. you imagine yourself the day after. Well, it's interesting. Uh, my family was having some guests over for dinner uh, around that time, and they were eating Italian food. And so the temptation to put mushrooms in the sauce was, it, it occurred to me, let's say. It occurred to me, right? Um, uh, and, and I just, you know, like you picture the next day, someone dead, and you're like, that's a thing you can't undo. Well, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine yourself dead. It's much so easier to imagine So the thought occurred to you and you fortunately didn't do it. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I still stand by exactly what I said in that, uh, in that, in that video, right? Like, yeah, I would need to be a lot more certain. 70% is not certain. enough when you're dealing with life and death. And that actually brings us a little bit to an Asim Taleb idea. Mm-hmm. I'm reading a book right now called Skin in the Game, which is precisely about this kind of risk transfer mechanism that people will use mm-hmm. where uh, you you pass on the negative downsides of a risk to mm-hmm. someone else. And basically his whole book is about why that is absolutely not okay, mm-hmm. um, including in finance. Uh, and he uses uh, banking and a few other industries to, to describe what he calls the Bob Rubin trade which is a trade where the upside risk goes to you, it, the knowledge of whether or not the mushroom is safe goes to you, and the downside risk of if it happens to be really bad, it kills someone, goes to someone else, which mm-hmm. is testing mushrooms on another human being. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, well, and the interesting thing to me about skin in the game is that Nassim Taleb seems to think that he can... Uh, well, I don't know if he thinks he can build a complete moral system out of this, but he certainly thinks he can build a moral system out of the idea that... Uh, you should have skin in the game. If you are playing the game, then you should have the potential for negative downside. Specifically for negative risks. I mean, yeah. it's not enough for you to have... Uh, it's not an incentive problem where you have just... You just need to share some of the benefit. No, you The need benefits to share... are not enough. You need to share the pain. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he, he talks uh, a lot about... Assuming that there is pain, right? Et cetera, is purpose, but... You, you, you should not have upside without downside. You should not have potential upside without potential downside, more he, precisely. He links the idea quite a bit to the concepts of honor that mm-hmm. uh, go with traditional notions of leadership, mm-hmm. where leadership and uh, societal benefits, like the benefits enjoyed by the, uh, the aristocracy, mm-hmm. are contingent on their being willing to take horrendous negative downside risk. I mean, you're only mm-hmm. the king if you're the first one in the battle and the last in the retreat. Mm-hmm. And if you don't fill that requirement, you are not worthy of the office. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so if you're not taking the downside risk, you don't count mm-hmm. and you don't uh, merit the, the top spot. Well, and this is this is one of the reasons. I used to be a lot freer with advice than I am now. And now I'm like, I'm, I'm pretty darn measured and careful with my advice because partially for this reason, right? That I don't share the downside. People can take my advice and if my advice is terrible, uh, I don't bear any penalty for that, yeah. right? <laughs> I don't bear any penalty for that. Uh, and so in some sense, like, I- I'm not going to say that giving advice is immoral. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying it's dangerous, at least potentially dangerous, and it should be treated with a little bit more, morally, more caution. Morally uh, dangerous at the very least. Right? Yeah. Advice, advice is not as cheap as we sometimes think it is, or at least it should not be. And there's all kinds of incentive problems tied up in that. Like if, if someone is advising something because they receive mm-hmm. a benefit, which, mm-hmm. you know, goes, I guess, to sponsorships a little bit. Yeah. A and little... that's a question that we've wrestled with, <laughs> is whether or not we can ethically uh, uh, sponsor stuff. Q our Audible ad. No, just <laughs> no, We'll do that in a second. Um, <laughs> Gosh. Um, well, yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about the dilemma <laughs> before and before and maybe... Should I recommend a mushroom yeah. hunting book on audible.com that I haven't read yet? Is that ethical? Probably um, not. Nassim Taleb would say no, and I would, I would, I mean, I think I would, roughly speaking, agree. I, I think I would agree. One of the things that he uses for advice, though, that I find incredibly useful is, he says, don't tell me what you think, tell me what's in your bank account. Mm-hmm. And more or less, that's, d- d- would you say that well, that's a proxy for well, the way that we it, take sponsors? The, the thing is, I would say, first of all, what does that statement mean? And the way I interpret that statement is, uh, don't tell me what you think, tell me what you do fundamentally. Yes. Show me show me your behavior patterns. In other words, show me what you do when there's actual risk attached to your actions. Sure. Um, uh, are you paying for this service? Are you paying that for you potential downsides? Yeah. 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 Well, and you know, in that case we we uh, cross that hurdle quite nicely, right? That works for um, Yeah. But but more generally, are you are you taking the negative downside? I mean, mm-hmm. one example of this that I think is perverse is when professors are given free copies of textbooks. Uh, so that they will recommend that textbook to their students. And in that case, the professor is not accepting the negative downside, i.e. buying the textbook mm-hmm. and incurring the 
the cost benefit question. I mean, is this worth the however many hundreds of dollars the stupid textbook is? Mm -hmm. And if they get a free copy, then I, I think their incentives are wrong. I think if a professor is going to recommend the textbook, they have to have physically purchased it. Hmm. That would be an example of that idea carried out in a domain other than investments. Well, I mean, I think the right way to look at it is that it's a good heuristic for its quality, right? Okay. Uh, I mean, it's 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 perfectly conceivable that you could be gifted a textbook and that it actually is a good textbook. So a heuristic uh, for our listeners is a rule of thumb. It is something that is not an absolute rule, and you don't know if it's true 100% of the time, but it is a rule that if you follow them most of the time, it's going to turn out okay. It, it's mm -hmm. a red flag rule. And so an example of this would be uh, things that smell bad are probably not good to eat. Yeah, mushrooms Mushrooms with noxious smells should not be eaten. Is that the actual thing that will make something bad? Will some bad things slip through that filter? Yes. Are some things that smell bad actually edible just fine? Yes. Yeah. I'm thinking specifically of blue cheese, which I find to be, you know, Repulsive? very, very... No, I find it to be very edible. I just don't like the smell. Right? <laughs> My dad uh, says it smells like baby barf and dirt <laughs> mixed together, which smells about right, but it actually yeah, tastes okay. Yeah, it tastes okay. so good, right? Yeah. Um, or durian fruit. I mean, there's other things as well that smell awful and, you know, they're okay. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to say something real fast about the epistemology of mushrooms. This is what we've ostensibly been on for like the last 10 minutes. But now I really do want to say something about the epistemology of mushrooms. Um, and, it, and it is this, right? So one of the problems that I ran into while I was trying to figure out what this mushroom, mushroom species is, is that like the mushroom identification world, at, at least in this situation to me, was not, not easy to penetrate, let's say. It was not an easy world to enter and to uh, to to get gain mastery useful. in. Yeah, or not even just gain mastery, but yeah, to get anything useful from. Um so uh, I mentioned in the video, I have an uncle who's usually pretty good with identifying mushrooms, right? So I sent him a picture and uh, he said, I, I said, well, you know, I found this mushroom. Here's a couple of pictures. I think it's a puffball. And he said, uh, it's not a puffball. And I can't tell you any more than that. Um, and so the, the problem is something like there's so many different varieties of mushroom that he can positively identify the most common ones, right? But to expect him to have knowledge on all the kinds of mushrooms is just not realistic, Right. Um, and so he can tell me a few things that it isn't, but that doesn't mean that he can tell me what it is. So then I go online, right? And I start searching through databases and I find one of two situations. Either I find pages that are like, here are seven types of common edible mushrooms in North America, right? And I scroll down. It's like, okay, this doesn't match any of the pictures. Therefore, it is not one of those seven kinds. So I know it's not one of the seven most common types of edible mushrooms in North America, but that still doesn't tell me if it's edible or not, right? It might be one of the less common edible mushrooms, or it might be a totally poisonous mushroom. I can't tell yet, right? Then uh, another situation that I run into is just finding massive online databases of every type of mushroom ever known to man, right? And so you have to start scanning through and trying to match characteristics. And so you're, you're scanning through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mushrooms, matching them one by one in sort of like this brute force attack method. And it's just, it's just stupidly inefficient. Or for that one, you need to be able to identify at the, mm -hmm. at the correct biological terminology level what it is you're seeing on the mushroom. Yeah, so another, another approach is you can start searching for the mushroom with like specific characteristics, right? Okay, so I've got a, the cap. Okay, that's at least not too technical, right? The cap of the mushroom is brownish, white, and it has these little, uh, this rough uh, sort of texture on the top. Um, one of the interesting things I found out is that there's two different names for that rough texture on top, depending on what kind of mushroom it is. If it's part of the shroud, hang on, let me see if I can get this right. Uh, oh, I can't remember which, but if it's part of the, the original shroud of the mushroom, then uh, it's called either warts or scales, and if it's not part, it's the other. Right, and so you actually have to know whether it's warts or scales, and you have to be able to identify whether or not it came. And you from need the to be able shroud. to identify things like spore prints and all the rest of the stuff. Yeah, so that was another thing that I started running into is they were like, "We'll post a spore print online," and I was like, "What's a spore print? How do you do that?" So now I know how to do spore prints, right? Um, or at least I, I I could probably do a spore print. Um, Right, but the, the the interesting thing is that once I walked into that world, the, the problem was not that I couldn't get answers to my questions. The problem that I was too stupid to ask the right questions, right? Like I did not reach that minimum threshold of knowledge and experience to even start asking the right questions. Which gets us to uh, completeness, completeness versus incompleteness in a body of knowledge. Because the way that most people learn edible plants and animals and, and stuff mm -hmm. is this one is edible, and every time you recognize that one, you'll pick a friend out of the crowd. It's mm -hmm. like identifying cars. Mm -hmm. um, you're able to identify the Toyota Corolla because that's what you've, your family grew up mm -hmm. driving. And then you don't know the... Some, you don't... 
you don't have a system for knowing cars. You mm -hmm. learn a few of them like friends in a crowd. Mm -hmm. And over time, you learn more and more and more of these. And if you learn bad ones and good ones, and you start filtering mm -hmm. those into two categories. But you never get this uh, a rule that will give you It's very hard to knowledge codify of the that knowledge. It's very yes. hard to, to, to represent it and sort of like put it into a mental zip file, like shrink the, like compress yeah. the data. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, and it's it, like, I mean, there's 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 so many different types of mushrooms and you then you think, okay, well, like, maybe we can just like hit the phylogenetic tree and start like figuring out which classes and genuses and so on and families are poisonous and which are non-poisonous. But even within the same genus, there can be two different mushrooms and one's poisonous and one is not poisonous. Yep. And so like, it, 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 it's just an insanely complicated body of knowledge. It is. It's an not, insanely complicated It's not a rule-based body of knowledge. It's a... Uh, you have to memorize and learn individual parts because you're picking them out bits at a time, moving your way forward. And I actually find this type of knowledge to be very interesting. Or, or at least if there are rules, I don't know what they are yet. You, if there are rules, we don't know what they are. So w learning this type of thing, I find uh, you can't cheat. <laughs> you can't uh, stay up until, you know, two in the morning the day before your test uh, out in the woods and just cram and learn a couple of rules that you can then apply. Mm -hmm. There are some bodies of knowledge where you can do that, but in this type where it's uh, it's memorization driven, it's recognition and familiarity, mm -hmm. and you have the, the yes list and the no list, and then you have a, an unknown quantity in your I don't know list at any given time, mm -hmm. and you never know how the size of that is shrinking or growing. You just don't know. Mm -hmm. There's there's a category of ones that you know are bad, the ones that you know are good, and then this unknown size quantity of ones that you don't, just just don't know. Question mark. Yeah. And, uh, and the way that mark. you act with that <laughs> until unknown. you feed it to your dog, right, and then decide to take a bite yourself. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, are we good on that? Yeah, I think we're okay. so. Okay. In that case, let me just talk to you about Audible for one second, and then we'll jump into the Fremont Pit House and the other things that come out of the Fremont Pit House. So, um, Audible. Audible is a massive, massive, massive provider of online audio content, primarily audiobooks. Uh, there's some other stuff on there too, but primarily audiobooks. And uh, both Joseph and I, I just realized that statement's true no matter which one of us says it. True. Um, both Joseph and I use Audible. Um, we're big fans of it. We used it before um, we contacted them to see about becoming sponsors for them. Uh, so, well, we, we, we like it. We use it. We're fans. Yep. I pay for a yearly service and I enjoy it very much. Yep. Um, Included, oh, yeah. included with the service includes access to a number of uh, newspaper agencies. Uh, you also get free uh, workout, meditation courses, and then there's the Great Courses Plus, which I the Great Courses, which I really enjoy, mm -hmm. um, and books, lots and lots of books. Yeah. So let's jump into the uh, Fremont Pit uh, House. AudibleTrial.com slash basic if you want to try out a free trial of that. Um, it helps support the show, and I, I'm pretty sure you'll like it. Yes. If you like listening to this podcast, you'll like it. So I like it. So uh, there we go. Okay, yeah, so for the Fremont Pit House, right? Um, so this thing yeah, go. Uh, is a dirt shack. Uh, it is uh, a low house to the ground. It's more or less square. Uh, it's got four kind of pyramid-shaped walls on the sides with a flat roof, and it's, it's dirt. Um, mm -hmm. When you go inside, the floor is dirt, the walls are dirt, the ceiling is made out of logs that are covered in dirt. Um, it's a dirt shack. Mm -hmm. Now, is that impressive? Would you want to live in one? First answer for me, at least, was no. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a dirt house. Yeah, like... I mean, okay. What's what's the advantage here? But, you know, we, we happened to go there on a day, visit this museum where this uh, replica pit house was on a day that was quite hot. It was close to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And... Uh, you had a sunburn. I, I, did. I, I did. I didn't I have, have a bad as bad of a sunburn. Sunburns. And then we went into this thing to see what it was like inside, and the temperature difference was instant and very uh, surprising. Well, and again, and I think it did come through in the video, what surprised me most was not just the temperature difference. It was the fact that uh, that it, there was a breeze inside. Right? Yeah. Like, it was, like when I say air-conditioned, it's not just that it was cooler inside. It's that you could actually like get uh, noticeable air movement. Yep. And the upshot of that is it was surprisingly good. Now, do I want to move my family uh, and all my kids well, it would into have to a be small a little larger, shack? first of all? First of all. <laughs> um, and, you know, it would it have would to have Wi-Fi, outlets. for one yeah, thing. There's, there's a couple things. <laughs> but uh, things. It, it was uh, eye-opening for the reason that it looked super primitive and bad. 
And Mm -hmm. walking into it, I was able to appreciate a a previously unknown virtue of the thing. Well, so one thing you've thought about and wondered about a lot, I know, in the conversations we've had is uh, rammed earth houses, building houses out of earth, sort of like building houses that fit into the landscape and uh, naturally respond to climate conditions Mm -hmm. around it. Yep. The idea of using thermal batteries, basically storing heat so that... uh, they self-stabilize in the mm-hmm. in the summer they're cooler than the outside and during the winter they're warmer than the outside without any additional furnaces or air conditioning or anything mm-hmm. that kind of structure i think is incredibly cool for one thing i mean it's it's cheaper on your energy bill but on the other it's uh i mean it, it avoids waste yeah sorry keep going i was just i'm building the, up. I'm, I'm building up to something here oh, okay something. okay <laughs> I'll, I'll keep rambling i'm filibustering okay. So here's something really interesting to me about it is the fact that like, so when you talk about it avoiding waste, to me, it's even more than that. It's the fact that uh, it, 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 it's unnecessarily complicated. Sorry, it, what I mean is it's unnecessarily complicated to do it another way. Does yes. Okay. So having a separate air conditioning system and a furnace and all these things, if you didn't need them. Presumably, if you can figure out a way to not have them, then it's an unnecessary layer of complication. Right. And all things being equal, if you can get the same level of temperature where it's comfortable uh-huh. either way, the one that is less complicated and more robust is, to be is better. Yeah. And so, I mean, th- that's an interesting thing. Now, do I want to live in a Fremont-style pit house? No. And they frankly went out of style hundreds of years ago, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But the principles that are used there, if we can extract the principle and take the good from the Fremont pit house and then apply it into a modern dwelling... Well, and even there's some variations on that. Like one thing that interests me, and I know this is this is like the the, the smallest, easiest trick in the book for uh, kind of uh, doing uh, a more primitive form of uh, climate control inside your house, um, but is to have large south-facing windows that are covered in vines of some kind. Yep. Right. And so in the summer, uh, the vines grow over, right, and form a form a shield from the sun. And then in the winter, the vines all die off, and then you've got large windows that let in light and heat and you can even do it without the vines what you can do is the the pitch of your house the roof angle i mean the sun is during the summertime uh if if you live in either the more northern hemisphere or the more southern hemisphere where there's a larger difference in the angle Mm -hmm. the sun will be more directly above you during the summertime and more of it at, at a slanty angle mm-hmm. during the winter. And the result of that is if the sun is here and then it moves to here, that angle will get in through my roof. And so that just by controlling that angle mm-hmm. where the roof is relative to the window, you can make it so that the sunshine will get in through the window during the winter, it, but not it, during it the summer. It will get in more during the winter yes. than the summer. Yeah. Yeah. And so that okay. passive solar design is just incredibly cool. But as much as, as much as we love Fremont pit houses, there's actually a much larger question we're dealing with here. Yes, yeah, so and we were actually and dealing much, with it much, there. Much, much, much larger question. And that a huge is... huge question. What is good and basic? <laughs> what are we doing? So uh, w- w- let's contextualize this question a few different ways. Uh, first off, we do a lot of really interesting but very varied stuff. About half of the stuff that we do seems to be... In case you somehow be... hadn't noticed, and thank you for sticking with us. <laughs> you are like, very I don't welcome. Know, I don't know what else to say, man. Yeah, <laughs> like... thank you. Thank you. Uh, this this bit is going to be a bit more meta. We're just going to talk about how Good and Basic is going. Mm-hmm. Uh, about half of what we do is much more philosophy heavy. Uh, it's about the ideas themselves. Or at least seems to be more philosophy heavy. And then the other half seems to be more uh, making stuff from scratch heavy. At Project least seems videos. To. At least seems to. And then yeah. th- there's a bunch of connections between these two. One of them is, uh, like with the Fremont Pet House, what is the, the idea embedded in there? What is the unexpected yeah. good in the thing? Well, and I, I just can't help but plug this in. This is one of the ideas that absolutely changed the way I look at things is um, John Piaget's research into little kids playing games. So it turns out that little kids, you know, like six to eight years old, um, around that age can play games uh, without knowing the rules. I, I put knowing in air quotes because... Uh, they can, I mean, obviously they know the rules in some sense because they can play the game, right? Sure. But if you take them apart afterwards, they'll give uh, mutually inconsistent and internally contradictory accounts of the rules. In other words, they can play the game, they can't explain the game, right? Yeah. So around the age of 12, um, apparently, according to John Piaget's research, um, children are able to not only play the game, but also to explain what's going on in the game, right? So, and, and the reason why that's so important is because it actually turns out you can look at your life, you can look at your actions and say, hey, wait a second, what is it I'm doing? Because I'm probably doing things that I haven't figured out the explanation for yet. And I'm doing is... things without knowing, without having a good, mm, explicit, philosophic description of what it is. 
Socrates had this statement that the unexamined life is not worth living, and there's a couple of different ways to interpret what he was doing. One way, which is I think the more common way, particularly in philosophy, or the formal study of philosophy, is to say that if you can't give a formal explanation for something, then you don't know it. Uh, the only knowledge that counts is formal explanation. Um, ones that you can, can explicitly weigh out and say, this is what it, it is that I'm doing, this is what it is that I believe. Mm -hmm. But the other way of, and Socrates was extremely good at teasing people to people's responses out mm -hmm. so that he was able to show where they eventually butted up against a wall where they just didn't have good answers anymore and or looped back and became circular. Mm -hmm. I don't like that explanation. I think it is more honest to say that all human knowledge uh, butts up against a wall, a wall of faith or embodied practice that is not um, articulable. Or at least not articulated yet. Or at least not articulated yet. So per theoretically it could be, but we haven't. And so it would be really handy to have a philosophy that allows you to operate still without that explicit well, knowledge. And you have to remember that you you yourself depend upon, like every, every individual, every human being depends a lot upon uh, non-articulated kinds of knowledge. For example, your digestive system, right? Like you have no freaking clue what your digestive system is doing. You don't tell it how to work, right? It just does its thing. Yep, and it gives you some information right. and it will occasionally cuss you out if you ate the one mm -hmm. thing. But none of that is, let's say, explicit. Yeah. Uh, in the, it, it, what I mean is it's not explicitly represented. It's not abstract, right? It's it's very... Very concrete. Very embodied, very physical, very... Yeah, anyway, so... And well, you can learn okay. to do... I mean, w working with your digestive system, for example, I mean, you get to know your own body. You get to know what uh, what foods will work well together, how much is too much of a thing. Um, I mean, you're, you're constantly calibrating, but a lot of that calibrating is not uh, f quantifiable, or at least yes. quantified. In terms yeah, of the way that you yeah experienced again like it. you don't you don't know how your digestive system is excreting or excuse me is like sucking out the vitamins right sure. you never have to tell it to suck out there's nothing there is no moment where you're like digestive system I need you to suck out more vitamins right uh, instead of just kind of it, it does it without any let's say conscious interference on your part yeah right um, so what this has to do with good and basic is the following is uh, we we constantly run into a problem where people you know. We're, talking to someone we're like well we run a youtube channel they're like oh that's so cool what is it called well it's called good and basic oh that's so cool what do you do on it and we're like a lot of yes stuff. things <laughs> right um so the the central question here is okay so so what is it that is unifying all of these things right we've been playing a game we're like six-year-olds playing a game uh, now that we're 12 years old, and we're doing metaphorically the thing speaking without being able to explain the rules metaphorically speaking now that we're 12 years old uh what what's <laughs> What's what? What is the name of the game we're playing? How would yeah. you describe it? And actually, this would be kind of interesting. If you're listening right now, I would be curious for you to like write in the comments, like, what is your one sentence description of what this channel is? And I hope that doesn't make it sound like we're too lost because we feel like we know what we're doing. We just feel like it's hard to explain. We we like we know what we're doing well enough to do it most of the time. Although, frankly, uh, here's here's one way of articulating why you should care about being able to explain the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. So Socrates' this whole distinction between knowledge uh, that, that is justified true belief, the, the stuff up here that we're able to explain what you're doing, and then the knowledge that is, uh, shall we say, embodied but not uh, described or sure. just described yet. Um, wh which one is preferable? Uh, yes. I, if I would say... <laughs> Of the two, I'd Look, say, I don't want to tell my intestines how to suck out vitamin A. No. A, I don't know how to do it. And B, they do a great job of it by themselves. They do. The, the knowledge that helps you to survive and thrive and live well is the knowledge that's more important. Whatever is helping you to live well. And that's often going to be unarticulated knowledge. But articulated knowledge is incredibly helpful for one thing so that you can see what you're doing mm -hmm. and make conscious decisions to change it. Mm -hmm. And so... What we're doing right now is trying to discuss out what it is that Good and Basic is doing. And, and there's a lot of questions here. It's like branding, types of videos that we're doing, uh, formatting, uh, how many videos we post per week, whether or not, uh, I mean, how to financially sustain the thing. In, in case you couldn't tell, we're in a bit of a uh, phase of experimentation. Let's yeah, say. <laughs> phase of trying to figure out how, how this whole thing works, like what to do next. Mm -hmm. which is what we've talked about rhetoric. I mean, that's yep. what rhetoric is for. Is this to, is the indispensable art, is yeah. talking to figure out what to do next. And talking is rendering a type of knowledge articulable. Yep. And so what we're doing right now is try to figure, out, figure yep. it out so that we can make decisions. That was a long spiel. Yep.
That's exactly right. <laughs> so a couple of a couple of more concrete examples. Uh, the pace that we've been making videos at up to this point, we're trying to figure out. Uh, it's been kind of heavy. We've been posting about five videos a week for the last bit. Which we've loved. It's been awesome. For but... one thing, we've been able to organize videos into more or less coherent series mm -hmm. where we can tie it all up with uh, this podcast yeah. and then describe what it is that we've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, that has not worked for the last couple weeks and it might not work in the near future. We might, I th we're, we're talking about maybe scaling down to three videos a week, including the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, trying to figure the thing out. Another one is the, the financial side. So on YouTube, uh, with AdSense revenue, we're making about $2 a day. Um, woot, woot. Woot, woot, which when you consider each video <laughs> is several hours of production time to put together and planning and blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah, blah. Uh, it's not sustainable. I mean, presumably that changes over time. We don't know, but... The point here being, you know, like, I mean, it's not like we're complaining. It's not like we're trying to drown you in our Two sorrows hours a or, day. Or, That's or, awesome. unload, or unload that on you guys. Gratitude is the least, first response. At least, at least my, my feeling is that this has been a wild and crazy ride and that, uh, well, I hope it gets wilder and crazier, but like, it's been a wild and crazy ride in all the best ways. But, um, but well, we're just thinking out loud in front of you guys. That's, that's what's going on here. Yeah. So. Just probing, trying to figure the thing um, out. Um, yeah. So those are all the things that are circling around in our head. Um, do you mind? Joseph, if I make a pitch for what I what my one sentence description of the channel is, right? So we're we're gonna Go eat our it. own dog food, right? What is one <laughs> what is one sentence that describes the channel? Right? Okay. So here is my one sentence: practical philosophy and appropriate technology. Um, here's what I like about it: is that it captures what we consider to be both the philosophic and like more quote unquote practical side of this. Right. Um, while still being uh, philosophically and practically rich in both directions. Right. The whole point of the practical philosophy. Um, I did quite a few philosophy courses as an undergraduate. And although I learned a lot and although I value those courses, uh, there were some elements of academic philosophy that I found to be less than perfectly helpful, namely the fact that they're usually less than perfectly helpful. Right. Uh, not designed if, to be if useful. If you want to talk, it's the secular version of uh, arguing about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Um, right. And so uh, what has sort of, in my mind, guided the philosophic inquiries of this channel is, OK, but we need to figure out a way to uh, to live this. Right. You need to figure out uh, a way to make it practical. To you live to, the good. Yes. To live better. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, philosophy. And to is, live truer. Eh. Not just better, but also truer. Yeah, uh, you know, philosophy... Well, it's kind of what Piercing says in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, right? That, uh, you know, if metaphysics helps you with everyday life, then great. If not, forget it. Um, and then the appropriate technology side of things, the fact that... Well, you could just say technology, but uh, the, the fact that it's described as appropriate technology or that I'm describing it as appropriate technology is, is sort of a nod to the idea that, well, wait a second, like, some technologies could be better than others, and they could be better not just on grounds of, let's say, uh, raw efficiency or raw effectiveness. Um, you need to be optimizing for the right things. Yeah, you need to be optimizing for the right things. Uh, you know, if, if a technology is a tool, well, that tool needs to fit inside a broader ecosystem of other tools and uh, ends and means and values and things like that and uh, if you ignore that world it's not that you have good technology it's just that you're ignoring what technology is um so well that is my that is my one sentence pitch is practical philosophy and appropriate technology uh, i'll throw the ball over to you uh, do you Gosh. wish do you wish to critique that do you wish to posit your own one sentence summary uh i really really like that summary um, I like the emphasis on appropriate technology because it squeezes ethics in. Um, because you're, ma you're making value decisions mm -hmm. when you're talking about appropriate technology. It's about what are you optimizing for. Uh, mm -hmm. Technology is always purpose-driven. I want it to do the thing. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's purpose and intent involved. And so you can critique purpose and intent uh, together with, you know, just method. Um, method always is aimed at something, and so you can critique it that way. Um, I, I'm going to throw out another one. Uh, this one is more abstract and designed to try to catch everything, which means it's more abstract and it tries to catch everything. Mm -hmm. um, fundamental principles and practices of the true and the good. Mm -hmm. And why? I, just, <laughs> sorry, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead and de defend yours, and then I'm and then I'm going to pull out a howitzer and start trying to blow holes. In it. So <laughs> okay. So the the fundamentals. I, I really am fascinated, and this is something that. 
I always want to see a more fundamental, more refined, more basic version of a thing. Um, this is philosophical. What, what training constitutes work. that basicness? Like, what's what's the difference between something basic and more complex? Like, I know that sounds like a silly question, but can you can you make a form? Definitely review? needs to be can articulated. You, so can I? Well, I, well uh, I, I'm I'm cheating here because I actually want to pitch a, a formal definition. Pitch a formal definition. Does it have pieces that aren't needed to accomplish the purpose? So you're cutting out everything that's extraneous. That's one thing. Simplest version. I, I mm-hmm. like that. Uh, in addition to that one, I, I'm going to say yes to that definition. And also, what is the, the smallest unit that still works? Uh, so, uh, smallest unit of matter. I mean, physics is constantly were, interested uh, in this. If you lived, looking in, for the smallest if you lived on particle. Roshar, if you were a character in the Stormlight Archive, would you be a dustbringer? Maybe. The, the person who likes to break things to find out what's inside. <laughs> Is that possible? Um, because, you know, they, they also have the flying ones that do the same thing, the skybreakers. Yes. And I don't think I'd be one of those. But it's, it's the dustbringers who really like... They're the, it's it's not just that they break things, it's that they like to see what things are made of, is my understanding. Yes and no, because I want to see the smallest unit that still functions. Okay. And so that's that's a rule that I don't want to break. Okay. All right. The smallest unit that still functions. And so, you Joseph know, with... may or may not be a dustbringer. With, with things like blacksmithing... Um, you can do it with all the fancy equipment. You can do it with uh, with power hammers and with uh, $3,000 anvils uh, with the Peter Wright logo on the side and you know all the equipment in a well-stocked forge with uh, high-tech fuel. Or you can find a way to still accomplish the uh, results of blacksmithing and still make a good forged product using a home-built, super simple, stripped-down forge, which has only the absolutely necessary elements. And I want to I want to push my competence in that direction to say that I, I can do it with that. Hmm. Um, and then probably never go back there again because sitting on the ground that long is terrible and I don't we, enjoy it. We both it. have commented, you know, like doing the primitive forging has been eye-opening. It has been fun. It has not been a long-term solution. No, not at all. Uh, there are reasons I mean, there, to upgrade. Well, there are reasons why people decided to stick an anvil on a stump and forge standing up. <laughs> like. Yep. If you've tried both, then you know which one you prefer. Yep. You know which one you prefer. Um, sorry, I interrupted you. Did you? I wasn't aware. Okay, so... Um, well, you're, you're unpacking your definition of good and basic and makes things basic. Definition. So interested so in fundamental things and interested in two directions. So, so is it that you're practical... looking for the most basic thing that's still good? No, not really. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in fundamentals partially to reveal what is good. So one of the problems that we have with modern life is that there's too much going on rather than the problem of not enough. And so it seems that this sort of pairing back uh, and and seeing things in a more uh, refined, fundamental sort of way is actually really helpful in order to identify the good. I mean, if you can reduce I... what a technology does to a one-sentence summary of its actual effects, then you can start to evaluate those effects and say, do I actually want this thing to proceed? Huh. So in my uh, way, give, it's kind Give me of a, a concrete example. I, I, I can neither confirm nor deny yet. <sighs> in practice, it doesn't actually go that way. So I'm giving the equivalent of a sub-12-year-old's ex- explanation of the game. Uh-huh. Because in practice, a lot of these projects that we're doing, I'm doing because I think they're good. So well, and, and I mean, this is the core the core issue, right? Is what yeah. do mushrooms have to do with Fremont houses? <laughs> yeah, what do mushrooms have to do with Fremont houses? Have to do with a podcast? The the Buddhist in me wants to say, let's ask a different question. Okay, let's listen to the Buddhist. <laughs> There's actually a really, really powerful concept that we're going to talk about more in the future called Mu. So when asked a yes or no question, um, you could say that there are no dumb questions, but there actually are. So one, a loaded question is an example, like, when did you stop beating your wife? Or have you stopped beating your wife? And that question, if you answer... if you say, yes, I've stopped, that means that you, you were, were doing it before. if you say, no, I haven't stopped, that means that you're, you're still, still doing, doing it. it. So there's no way out. And so a, a response to that, it, that is used in Zen Buddhism, is mu, which means unask the question. 
it means the wrong question. Well, it, it can also mean yes and no, and neither yes nor no. It's like the question was the wrong kind of question to give a yes or no answer to. Moo. I believe it can also mean yes and no. Uh, I was just. Doing it can some, mean some it depends. It can mean no. Day. Yeah. But but okay yeah so let's let's so, ask a different question. Let's ask a different question. Um, so one one way of solving the problem is to not look for the grand answer, but to just look. I mean, you, you can plan your life out a, a thousand years in advance or ten years in advance. Sometimes the most that you can plan out into the future is a day or two. And so maybe the only thing that we need to figure out is, like, what we're posting next week. Well, well, and again, like, the, the thing is that six-year-olds can play a game, and there's nothing wrong with it. Sure. And you they're know, playing like, it. What are we going to do? Get mad at the six-year-olds for playing a game and not knowing the rules? Does it not count? Well, the correct, the correct answer is, well, you just, like, let the six-year-olds play their game and then wait until they're 12 and have the the cognitive maturity to start describing the rules yeah. so um okay well there's the question uh, uh, you know uh, i'm going to bring this back to mushrooms are you ready we're going to bring this full circle back oh, to dear. mushrooms so there's two different sort of how to put it there's two different levels on which the question of whether or not to eat a mushroom exists one is do i actually know what kind of mushroom this is and the second question is what am I going to do about it? One has to do with knowledge. One has to do with action, right? So, for example, even if I know it's a perfectly edible mushroom, I can just decide not to eat it, right? Uh, con- uh, you know, and par contra, if it is a poisonous mushroom, I can, in fact, decide to eat it, right? As, as has been commented, all mushrooms are edible once. Um, so, so, so here's the interesting thing to me, then, is that even... Uh, whenever you run across a mushroom, you're deciding what to do with the mushroom even when you don't have knowledge of what the mushroom is. Does that so make sense? So is that the fundamental question? The question isn't what is the mushroom. The question well, is what are you going to do with the mushroom? Yes, and what is the mushroom is a subsidiary question. I mean, it, it's a very nice question, right? Because if I can answer the question, yes, that's an edible mushroom, and I want to eat the edible mushroom, then I can have mushrooms in my spaghetti in the Uintas, and isn't that nice? And the correct answer is yes, that is very nice, Right. Um, but they're still technically separate questions. And so knowledge, including questions. articulated knowledge, exists to further action. And specifically to further your trying to, to do good things and live well. The Buddhist in me, that's the second time I've used this phrase. Apparently the Buddhist in me is very strong today. Um, the Buddhist in me does not like that articulation. Actually, the Taoist in me doesn't like that articulation of the problem. Uh, okay. But probably just doesn't like it because it's an articulated version. Wait, what's that? Uh, is that the Tao that first, can be first told? Line, first the line. Tao that can be told is not the true Tao. Yep. Will you say it again? Dao ka Dao Fei Chang Dao. That is awesome. Okay. Well, we're going to head go ahead and close that off there. So we are in just a little bit of a flux period where we're figuring out what works and what doesn't. So thank yep. you for your patience. We appreciate you viewing our videos. We are uh, rolling out our website in the near future, so that's great. Um, yeah, good stuff coming up soon. We'll see you next week.